Today we will study about nephropathology. So we know we have a pair of kidneys and these kidneys uh, they are connected to the bladder by the ureter and the uh, bladder gives the output of the urine via urethra. And similarly we have this abdominal aorta coming and it is becoming renal artery which is supplying to the uh, kidney. And in kidneys we have nephrons as the functional unit and these nephrons basically acts as to filter the blood so as to get rid of the waste material uh, from the blood. So these nephrons they are made up of a round structure which is called as glomerulus and this glomerulus has a afferent arteriole which is coming into the glomerulus and it is making capillaries over here and again exiting out as efferent arteriole. Here you can see in the cortical part in the cortex, renal cortex, cortex, this nephron with the glomerulus, the glomerulus part of the nephron is lying whereas in the medulla part of the kidney, the glomerulus the Bowman's capsule is changing into the proximal convoluted tubule which is continuing as the loop of Henle and uh, then the distal convoluted tubule and from the distal convoluted tubule the urine is going into the collecting duct and from the collecting duct it is going into the ureter. Nephropathy or the kidney diseases so these kidney diseases they causes certain uh, certain uh, conditions in the body which are called as acute kidney injury or previously it was called as acute kidney failure but now the term has been replaced by acute kidney injury so whenever there is reduction in the function of the kidney that is excretion of the waste products whenever there is reduction in that for seven days we call that condition as acute kidney injury or AKI we will study about this in detail second is chronic kidney disease when the kidney injury or the kidney diseases they become prolonged at least for more than three weeks and for three months then they become chronic kidney diseases that the condition is called as chronic kidney disease and another one is renal failure or kidney failure which is now termed as end stage renal disease ESRD where there is complete loss of kidney function and the person requires hemodialysis or the artificial interventions. Some important terminologies regarding to the, uh, regarding to the nephropathies. First is what is normal urine output. So 0.5 to 1.5 ml per kg per hour is the normal urine output you can see here for adult it is the urine flow rate should be greater than 0.5 for child it is greater than equal to 1 ml and for neonate it is greater than equal to 2 ml per kg per hour oliguria is less olig means less urea means urine so there is less urine output when the urine output is less than 300 ml per meter square means surface area of the body we are talking about uh, surface area so one 300 ml for 1 meter square in 24 hours if the urine output is less than that for children it is less than 0.5 ml per kg and for infants less than 1 ml per kg right usually it is considered that if a person is uh, urinating less than 500 ml per day if an adult is excreting less than 500 ml per day of urine then it is considered as oliguria whereas anuria anuria means very less urine output less than 100 ml per day if somebody is excreting urine then it is called as anuria whereas polyuria is when the urine output is high greater than equal to 3, three liters per day in adults and 2 liters per day in children nocturia is nocturia nocturia means noc means night at night if the frequency of urination if the person is going to urinate very much at night time then it is called as nocturia next is frequency some other terminologies which you should be aware of are frequency, urgency, hesitancy, incontinence. Frequency is the number of times at the rate or the rate at which a person micturates. Micturates means passes the urine with or without increase in volume. That means a person can increase the rate of micturation with the increase in volume 
or without the increase in volume for example in diabetes the volume of the urine is increased it is more than 2500 ml per day so with that increased volume the person passes urine at more number of times whereas in certain conditions for example urinary tract infections the the urine volume is not increased it is in the normal uh, volume but then also person will void the urine at many time so that is frequency frequency is increased micturition rate either with increase in volume or without increase in volume second is urgency what is urgency urgency is sudden desire to void the urine a person cannot hold his urine and he has to suddenly pass the urine otherwise it will leak out for example in the cases of neurogenic bladder where the uh, nervous supply to the bladder is not proper or the nervous supply is over excited or urinary tract infections the person has to urgently go to the urine go go to the urine passing then hesitancy hesitancy is delay in the initiation of micturition when the person uh, is having a delay to start the micturition the person you know keep on waiting in the washroom for the urine to come out that is called as hesitancy the urine is hesitant to come out example benign prostrate hypertrophy in males where the prostrate gland increases in size and it compresses the ureter it comes uh, compresses the urethra and uh, which causes hesitancy incontinence incontinence is involuntary leakage of urine so this incontinence is of many type first is stress incontinence when the urethral pressure the pressure over the urethra or pressure over the bladder is more for example if somebody is carrying a baby if somebody is pregnant so that can lead to pregnant women can lead to have an incontinence the, the urine will leak out because of the bladder pressure for example coughing for example uterus prolapse for example sneezing for example lifting heavy objects or for example pressing over the bladder when bladder is full urge incontinence urge incontinence means when the person has sudden desire to void and the person can no longer hold and the urine leaks out so that is called as urge incontinence it is mostly due to the muscles over activity the muscles of the bladder which are over active that is the deuterocele muscle of the bladder is over active example in elderly in the setting of urinary tract infections or in some neurological diseases for example stroke so then next is overflow incontinence overflow means when the bladder is full the uh, the urine leaks out automatically without the patient realizing it so that is because the deuterocele muscles are weak and the bladder is distended example in cases of benign prostate hypertrophy then then next terminology is nocturnal enuresis or bedwetting so bedwetting we all know bedwetting is wetting the bed with the urine so intermittent nocturnal incontinence means at the night time the patient uh, do the bedwetting then next is hematuria hematuria is blood in the urine uh we will talk about this hematuria in later on slides or we will talk about this hematuria in a separate slide right so hematuria is blood in the urine when the urine is mixed with blood and it comes out with the color of red then proteinuria and lipiduria these proteinuria and lipiduria whenever the urine consists of more proteins than the normal and more lipids than the normal then the urine becomes frothy it becomes it becomes a froth there is froth coming out of the urine so then how do we assess the renal functions how do we assess that the kidney is all right so there are few blood tests and there are few urine tests so the red here represents the test of the blood we take the blood sample and uh, the yellow here represents the urine sample we take the urine and we test it for few things so important blood test which represents renal functions are number 1 serum urea or blood urea nitrogen one and the same thing then serum creatinine then the ratio of blood urea nitrogen to serum creatinine then serum uric acid and some serum electrolytes like sodium potassium chlorine and bicarbonates whereas urine tests first is urinalysis the microscopic and the macroscopic ones then the urine proteins urine albumin urine creatinine then the albumin to creatinine ratio we take the urine albumin and the urine creatinine 
uh, values and we divide them then glomerular filtration rate which tells us about the filtration function of the glomerulus then urine glucose urine sodium potassium calcium phosphorus urine ketones urine bilirubin and urobilinogen urine cortisol urine culture urine osmolality and urine hcg we will talk about these tests in a separate slide so let us come to the nephropathies nephropathies are diseases of the kidney so i have summarized these nephropathies in eight types of nephropathies number one the congenital diseases number two the glomerulus or the 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 bowman capsules with the efferent and different arterioles now that glomerular is having some disease glomerular diseases next is the tubulo interstitial diseases the tubules that is the the distal convoluted tubule and the proximal convoluted tubule the loop of henle is having some disease or the cells in between these structures the cells in between dct and pct they are having some diseases so that is interstitial cells are having some diseases so tubulo interstitial diseases then urinary tract infections uh, this is another another group of kidney diseases that urinary tract obstructions when the tract is having some obstruction for example kidney stones urolithiasis then renal cyst there is cyst formation in the kidney then vascular disease the renal blood uh, vascular the, the vascular uh, supply is having some diseases the blood vessels are having some diseases then renal tumors so these eight categories we are going to study in detail number one is congenital kidney diseases these are probably not in your syllabus but you should know for example a genesis when there are no kidneys at all so the the fetus won't survive then ectopic kidneys when the kidney is not in their place they are somewhere else you can see it here or hypoplasia one kidney is not developed <coughs> or horseshoe shaped kidney when the kidneys are joined with each other so these are some of the congenital diseases next is glomerular diseases so we know that this is a glomerular this is glomerulus this glomerulus is also called as renal corpuscle and this bowman's capsule is lined with little anatomy is lined with podocytes here which which gives support these podocytes gives support to the uh, to the capillaries the glomerular capillaries the efferent arteriole is coming and it is giving out capillaries here so these capillaries are supported by a basement membrane and below the basement membrane we have podocytes here is the basement membrane you can see the the purple structure here and these small uh, cells here are podocytes they have feet like processes and in between the capillaries there are these mesangial cells you can see as mesangium intraglomerular cells these mesangial cells are also important because they are uh, there are many pathologies which takes place in these mesangial cells you can see mesangial cells here also the green color also they are also mesangial cells but they are extra glomerular glomerular mesangial cells and now here is the pct so the basic filtration takes place here the blood comes here and it filters these uh, these glomerular capillaries have uh, pores in them they are specialized capillaries from where the waste material according to the size passes out from them into the glomerulus and from the glomerulus it goes into the pct so glomerular disease is also called as glomerulopathies the diseases of the glomerulus are called as glomerulopathies so these can be result of primary kidney disease that means the disease inside the kidney has or the disease has originated inside the kidney for example iga nephropathies uh, which is also called as berger disease or the kidney disease which are secondary in origin that means the diseases of the other system they have got into the kidney for example diabetes which is a multi system disease because of the diabetes the kidney is affected so the disease is a secondary kidney disease so glomerulopathies can arise because of primary kidney disease for example berger disease or secondary kidney disease for example diabetes which is called as diabetic nephropathy or lupus nephritis which is as a result of systemic lupus erythematosus which is a systemic disease autoimmune disease so because of that autoimmune disease when the kidneys are affected by that autoimmune disease we call that condition as lupus nephritis most of the etiologies for these glomerular diseases or glomerulopathies are idiopathic there are no explained cause the presentation of some glomerulopathies are asymptomatic right most of them they are asymptomatic that means they have no symptoms at all and during the 
investigations only accidentally someone finds that they have a glomerulopathy glomerulonephritis is another term in which these glomerulopathies have inflammation in the glomerular capillaries which can be because of the primary disease or secondary disease so glomerulonephritis is another term where there is inflammation in the glomerular capillaries this glomerulonephritis can be acute or chronic right it can be acute glomerulonephritis agn or chronic glomerulonephritis cgn when this acute glomerulonephritis is progressive in nature that means it progresses and the the renal function deteriorates more and the person lands up into acute kidney failure or acute kidney injury then it is called as rapidly progressing glomerulonephritis chronic glomerulonephritis is a slow progressive glomerular disease which ultimately with time leads to kidney failure or end stage renal disease esrd so once again the glomerular diseases are many for example we have studied we know about iga nephropathy burger disease diabetic nephropathy these are all glomerulopathies right and glomerulopathies which have inflammation in them are specially called as glomerulonephritis so here i have uh, labeled the causes for these glomerular diseases so we know most of them they are idiopathic no cause whereas few of them they are because of the genetic mutations for example fsgs focal segmental glomerulosclerosis or mpgn membrano proliferative glomerulonephritis some infections can also lead to glomerular disease for example psgn post streptococcal glomerular nephritis that means after a streptococcal infection mostly in the throat region can lead to a glomerular disease just sim uh, as similar as similar to that of the acute rheumatic fever if you remember acute rheumatic fever it was also a post sequelae to throat infection of streptococcal so similarly the throat infection can also lead to the autoimmune condition which is post streptococcal glomerulonephritis bacterial endocarditis the bacterial infection of the endocardium can also lead to glomerulonephritis then malaria malaria in some of the conditions can lead to glomerular diseases glomerulopathies fungal infections hbv infections hepatitis b infection hepatitis c infections or hiv infections can also lead to glomerular diseases toxin toxin exposure if somebody is taking toxin for example lithium in certain drugs or nsaids the non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs for example diclofenac the antibiotics for example ciprofloxacin these are these uh, these leads to glomerular diseases in few patients or if taken in excess then autoimmunity some of the diseases they are autoimmune for example burger disease iga nephropathy in which there is immunoglobulin a involvement there is because of the antigen antibody complex or because of the complement system uh, the person develops autoimmune reactions which leads to glomerulopathies lupus nephritis this is systemic autoimmune diseases which leads to kidney involvement also atherosclerosis of the Uh, glomerular capillaries they also leads to glomerular diseases hypertension diabetes mellitus sle and thromboembolisms of the vessels blood vessels they also lead to glomerular diseases so what are the common clinical features for glomerular diseases if somebody is suffering with a glomerular disease for example acute glomerulonephritis or let us say psgn post streptococcal glomerulonephritis then generally it is asymptomatic and it corrects on its own but however in some of the patients symptoms can appear for example periorbital edema in the morning right periorbital means around the eye so uh, around the eye in the orbit uh, in the orbit there is loose connective tissue and that loose connective tissue is prone to get edema first so periorbital or edema in the morning is usually the clinical feature peripheral edema in the evening whereas the edema over the legs it is mostly evident in the evenings xanthelmas because of the lipid metabolism derangements because of the kidney diseases there will be lipid metabolism derangements which will lead to xanthelmas 
then muirke bands that is white um, bands in the fingernails malar rash if the person is suffering with systemic lupus erythematosus there will be a butterfly kind of rash which is called as malar rash over the face Pal- palpable purpura there will be redness over the skin which is palpable frothy urine the urine will be frothy because of the lipiduria and the proteinuria hematuria it could be the glomerular disease could result in uh, blood in the urine signs other signs are oliguria and hypertension the person could be suffering with oliguria if it is progressing and hypertension also the others other symptoms could be fever nosebleed hemoptysis because there will be derangement of the or leaking of the fibrinogen from the uh, from the blood into the urine so there will be hemoptysis nose bleeding the the bleeding disorders fatigue hair loss weight loss right and if this uh, glomerular diseases they progress it results into aki right the rapidly progressing glomerulonephritis rpg and leads to aki then there will be the signs and symptoms of aki we will talk about this aki in the end so what are the investigations always remember proteinuria and hematuria if they are there then they are strong indicators of glomerular diseases most of the times these glomerular diseases are undetected because they are asymptomatic and they correct on their own and the person hardly realizes that they have gone into the glomerular disease kidney is a very very strong structure it take cares of itself just like the liver especially if there are rbcs or there are rbc casts we will talk about this when we will talk about investigations in a different slide so this dysmorphic rbcs that means when the rbcs when the glomerulus start leaking the rbcs into the pct which normally should not happen then because this rbc passes through these narrow tubules it becomes dysmorphic it loses its normal shape the convex shape it loses and it becomes abnormal shaped like a star shaped so that is called a dysmorphic rbc and many rbcs they join together and they form casts casts are they take the structure of the tubules so if rbc cast or dysmorphic rbcs are present then it is a strong and uh, suggestion they give a strong indicators for glomerular diseases so now these glomerular diseases are broadly classified under two syndromes which are nephrotic syndrome and nephritic syndrome and these are common questions in the exam what is nephrotic syndrome or what is nephritic syndrome so nephrotic syndrome basically nephrotic syndrome the difference between nephrotic and nephro nephritic syndrome is basically at the level of the excretion of protein in the urine if the excretion of protein in the urine is greater than 3 grams per day then it then the condition is called as nephrotic if it is less than 3 grams per day then it is called as nephritic more or less other symptoms are same for example hypertension hypertension the patient develops hypertension in both syndromes hypercholesterolemia hyperlipidemia more or less in both syndromes especially nephritic syndromes are concerned or are uh, having hematuria with dysmorphic rbcs and rbc casts so if hematuria is present with proteinuria with moderate proteinuria we label that as nephritic syndrome and these nephritic syndromes are mostly associated with inflammation with nephritis whereas the nephrotic syndromes are mostly uh, concerned with uh, the chronic diseases for example diabetes diabetic diabetic nephropathy right other examples are amyloidosis which is a systemic disease uh, minimal change disease mcd mostly found in children focal segmental glomerulosclerosis or membrane glomerulonephropathies right membrano proliferative and membranous glomerulonephritis so these are few examples of which we in which nephrotic syndrome is seen once again the difference between nephrotic and nephritic syndrome is basically in the proteins and in hematuria the proteins are lost more in the nephrotic syndrome whereas hematuria is seen more in the nephritic syndrome so what happens when this nephrotic or nephritic syndromes are there in the body so this is the pathophysiology the glomerular damage it leads to increased permeability of the glomerular basement membrane if you remember the purple color membrane 
in the previous photo so there is increased permeability of the globular glomerular basement membrane which leads to the leaking of protein which should not be there in a normal kidney so the leaking of protein leads to the protein urea the coming the uh, increase in quantity of protein in the urine is called as protein urea which is the pathological is greater than 3.5 grams per day if it is coming massively greater than 3.5 grams per day right we collect the urine for complete 24 hours from the patient and we we find the um, uh, the total number of proteins lost in that urine in 24 hour urine if it is greater than 3.5 gram per day it leads to hypoalbuminemia because the major protein in the urine is albumin so if protein is lost that means more albumin is lost and the uh, the blood will now having less albumin hypo means less albumin means albumin protein emia means blood so there is less albumin in the blood so now the serum albumin levels goes less than 3 grams per 100 ml the normal is up to 3.5 grams per ml so it goes less than 3 grams and we know that this, this albumin protein is the major protein which makes the oncotic pressure of the blood vessels so the plasma oncotic pressure is now less because these proteins are less which will lead to decreased plasma volume because this oncotic pressure is responsible for maintaining the blood pressure inside the capillaries so there is less plasma volume less plasma volume will lead to the less glomerular filtration rate right the fil the rate at which the glomeruli filters the normal is from 90 to 130 ml per minute so which is less uh, if it becomes less it leads to the activation of the uh, ras system and the aldosterone secretion the aldosterone secretion leads to the sodium and water retention you remember the ras system renin angiotensin aldosterone system so whenever there is low glomerular filtration right the blood supply to the kidney whenever it decreases it leads to the activation of the renin it leads to the release of renin from the jga cells and from the those ren that renin will uh, cause the angiotensin 1 to convert into angiotensin 2 and the angiotensin 2 will lead to the release of aldosterone and this aldosterone will lead to the sodium and water retention in the kidney so thereby increasing the blood volume the plasma volume now the uh, the blood does not have albumin protein so the blood cannot hold the water inside the blood vessel so it starts leaking out into the tissues which leads to edema so this is the pathophysiology of edema so it, it will lead to edema the glomerular damage will lead to edema also the hyperlipidemia because of the lipid uh, metabolism disorder because of um, because of the glomerular damage there will be lipiduria in the urine so after glomerular diseases let us move on to the tubulo interstitial diseases the diseases of the pct dct and the interstitial cells so these tubulo interstitial diseases are clinically they are a collection of disorders just like glomerular diseases which share tubular and interstitial injury right these are divided generally into acute and chronic and acute and chronic nephritis and acute tubular necrosis so first is acute tubule interstitial nephritis right acute tubulo interstitial nephritis acronym is atin right so this atin it it uh, takes place whenever there is injury to the pct dct and the interstitial cell nephritis means inflammation whenever there is inflammation in the kidney which leads to the damage to pct dct and uh, the interstitial cells the common causes are antibiotics the antibiotics they uh, they at higher doses or certain people are allergic to certain antibiotics which leads to interstitial nephritis which is which ultimately if progressive it also leads to acute kidney injury or acute kidney failure certain nsaids for prolonged time leads to acute tubulo interstitial nephritis diuretics for example people take diuretics to uh, lower their blood pressure or to lower the edema in their body right diuretic drugs like spironolactone 
एंटी कन्वर्सन ड्रग्स इन्फेक्शंस सर्टन बैक्टीरियल वायरल इन्फेक्शंस और सर्टन ऑटो इम्यून कंडीशन लाइक एस एल ई दे लीड्स टू एक्यूट ट्यूबुलो इंटस्टिशल नेफ्राइटिस दैन क्रॉनिक ट्यूबुलो इंटस्टिशल नेफ्राइटिस दिस ट्यूबुलो इंटस्टिशल नेफ्राइटिस और ट्यूबुलो इंटस्टिशल डिसऑर्डर कैन बी क्रॉनिक ऑल्सो फॉर एग्जाम्पल सिकल सेल डिजीज पीपल हु आर सफरिंग विद सिकल सेल डिजीज दे माइट एंड अप हैविंग क्रॉनिक ट्यूबुलो इंटस्टिशल nephritis lithium if certain drugs especially antipsychotic drugs they contain lithium heavy metals like lead cadmium and for the matter of fact mercury right they also leads to chronic tubulo interstitial nephritis anti neoplastic drugs means anti cancer drugs immunosuppressant drugs like cyclosporin obstructive uropathies right that means if there is obstruction if there is let us say stone inside the ureter which leads to obstruction that can lead to chronic tubulo interstitial disease nephritis then third and the most dangerous uh, aspect of tubulo interstitial disease is acute tubular necrosis atn this acute tubulo necrosis is the necrosis that means the death of the tubules which ultimately leads to the loss of the nephron so this acute tubulo necrosis is generally irreversible and it leads to permanent kidney damage whereas these acute and chronic tubulo interstitial disorders they are generally reversible so diarrhea and vomiting diarrhea and vomiting leads to the blood volume loss the blood volume loss will leads to the uh, decreased perfusion hypoperfusion of the kidneys which leads to the tubular necrosis because of the ischemia of the tubules the tubules will not get enough blood supply uh, and uh, it will lead to ischemia which will lead to necrosis so diuretics right if uh, diuretics again lead to hypovolemia again leads to ischemia of the uh, tubules leading to acute tubular necrosis then congestive cardiac failure in congestive cardiac failure also the blood volume uh, is less because the blood the the fluid transfers from the um, blood vessels to the um, interstitial spaces so in congestive cardiac failure also there is less pumping of the blood in through the blood vessels which leads to the ischemic injury ultimately necrosis of the tubules snake bite and other toxins they also lead to tubular necrosis so acute tubulo interstitial nephritis is an inflammatory condition where inflammation and the edema of the renal interstitium and the tubules develops in days to months right most of the time it is allergic it is a, a allergic drug reaction that means allergies to certain drugs for example most commonly sulfur drugs are having allergies to certain people to many people so these allergic drug reactions leads to acute tubulo interstitial nephritis also from certain infections patients develop acute tubulo interstitial nephritis and it is reversible the damage to the kidney is reversible this atin can cause acute kidney injury and uh, especially in cases where it is severe or the treatment is not proper or the offending drug for example the allergic drug is not discontinued and it can also lead to permanent injury and chronic kidney disease but this acute tubulo interstitial nephritis hardly uh, progresses into chronic kidney disease symptoms and signs may be non specific and they are often absent unless symptoms and signs of renal failure develop right so most of the time it it goes unnoticed because of asymptomatic condition however if somebody is having an allergic drug reaction in them then there are certain signs and symptoms which they appear for example if if somebody is allergic to say let us say ciprofloxacin the common antibiotic then the person will be having fever urticarial rash that means skin rash urticarial type of rash eosinophilia right in their body in the blood also and in the urine also right and uh, um, abdominal pain weight loss bilateral renal enlargement can also be seen right peripheral edema hypertension are less common polyuria and nocturia are also common right so these are the few conditions which can appear in acute tubulo interstitial nephritis so always remember allergic drug reactions leads to atin eosinophilia eosinophilia leukocytouria that means more amount of wbcs in the urine will be there eosinophilia there will be more eosinophils in the urine also and in the uh, blood also oliguric renal failure 
the person will be having oliguria which is a, which is characteristic of renal failure in renal failure the first thing that comes is oliguria serum creatinine level rises because the the kidney is not able to filter creatinine which is a waste product uh, from the degradation of the muscles proteinuria will be there right and renal biopsy will show interstitial edema under the microscope right so the microscopic test will show the the renal biopsy will show the interstitial edema as well right so once again the allergic drug reaction most of the allergic drug reactions or the most important cause for acute tubular interstitial nephritis is allergic drug reactions then there is chronic tubular interstitial nephritis which results from a chronic tubular injury chronic tubular insult right which is gradual which leads to fibrosis in the tubular interstitial compartments and tubular atrophy dysfunctions which leads to chronic tubular interstitial nephritis ctin causes are mostly immunological immediate disorders for example sle infections obstructive nephropathies for example uh, nephrolithiasis the kidney stones drugs some certain drugs they causes uh, chronic tubular interstitial when taken for a long time right so generally the ctin are labeled as these analgesic nephropathies when because of certain analgesic drugs for example paracetamol if it causes tubular interstitial nephritis analgesic nephropathies metabolic nephropathies if somebody is having a metabolic disease for example diabetes heavy metal nephropathy if somebody has taken heavy metals for example mercury for a longer time and his tubular tubular interstitial uh, structures have damaged so heavy metal nephropathy is reflux nephropathy is right reflux means because of the kidney stones and all symptoms and signs are generally absent in chronic tubular interstitial nephritis unless kidney failure develops so it goes unnoticed until and unless patient starts developing renal failure next is urinary tract infections so urinary tract infections are the infections of the urinary tract which could be bacterial viral fungal right here you can see in this picture you can see if the infection is in the kidney it is called as pyelonephritis if it is in the ureter it is called as infection of the ureter if it is in the bladder it is called as cystitis if it is in the urethra it is called as urethritis so infection can dwell at many places generally the infection which starts from the urethra if untreated or if if the person is on the immunosuppressive drugs then it goes to uh, the bladder and causes cystitis and that in it ascends up and causes pyelonephritis kidney is very rarely affected by the infections generally the urethra and the bladder are affected so what is uti the microbiologically uti is whenever the organisms in the midstream sample of urine midstream means when we take the sample we take the mid stream of the urine right not the front and not the end of the stream of urine so when the midstream urine contains 10 raised to the power 5 organisms more than 10 raised to the power 5 organisms bacteria and all in them then we consider that as uti more it is more common in female utis are more common in female because in females the urethra has close proximity to the anus in males most of the times utis are absent but if there are utis mostly they are associated with some structural deformity for example if a male is suffering with kidney stones or prostate problems then they are more they are having more risk of developing utis otherwise not utis can be divided into lower tract infections and upper tract infections upper tract means when the kidney and the ureters are involved lower tract means when the bladder and the urethra are involved so the urethra the urethra is infected with some bacteria colonization and that colonization leads to the penetration of bacteria into the bladder and from the bladder it ascend through the ureter and goes to the kidney and causing pyelonephritis if pyelonephritis is untreated it might cause acute in, acute kidney injury or it might even cause chronic kidney diseases but it is highly unlikely it highly unlikely means uh, the pyelonephritis hardly causes acute kidney injury what are the causes the responsible organisms the bacteria are e coli 75% of the time it is e coli proteus mirabilis pseudomonas streptococci staphylococci chlamydia nisere herp chlamydia nisere these are the sexually transmitted diseases organisms which cause sexually transmitted diseases they can also cause 
um, this UTIs. And some viruses like herpes simplex virus or some fungal infections. Now the sign and symptoms according to the place, right? They also little bit having little difference. For example, if urethra is involved, then person mostly will be having burning urination, burning sensation in the urination and a discharge, a pus discharge or uh, some reddish discharge from the urethra. If bladder is involved, which is called a cystitis, then mostly the person is having lower abdominal discomfort, frequent painful urination, blood in the urine and pelvic pressure. The person will feel that the lower abdomen is having pain and pressure. However, if kidney is involved, then the person will be having a flank pain. That means the reno the vertebral angle will be having the renal angle or the reno vertebral site will be having uh, a, a pain high fever shaking and chills very important there will be chills the person will be having chills if a person is having chills with burning micturition and flank pain that is highly suggestive of acute pyelonephritis nausea vomiting also occurs clinical features the common clinical features are dysuria, painful urination, increased frequency, increased urgency, renal angle tenderness, flank pain, right? Pain in the pain at the site of the kidney, low in pain, lower abdominal pain, tenderness, low back pain, hematuria, fever, chills, rigors, chills, rigors, one and the same thing. Complicated UTI are uh, this is one more term complicated UTI now some UTIs are labeled as complicated UTI which requires prolonged treatment that is treatment for 30 days treatment for 15 days the antibiotics are given for 30 days or 15 days these complicated UTIs occurs in patients who are already ca already catheterized they are having catheters inside them for example in the setting of ambulatory patients then anatomical uh, uh, problems like somebody is having anatomical abnormality in their uh, ureter or urethra or bladder functional abnormalities for example somebody is having functional trouble in the bladder or some neurogenic bladder stones obstructions immunosuppression if somebody is on immunosuppressive drugs or somebody is suffering with hiv diabetes or they need prolonged antibiotics so uh, for if a male gets an UTI, the, that is considered as a complicated UTI because the length of urethra is very long in male and it is very difficult to flush out the infection. So males, they rarely get the UTI, but if they get UTI, then it is treated as a complicated UTI. Children, small children and pregnant females are also treated as complicated UTI plus patients who are admitted and catheterized or patients who have anatomical or functional abnormalities, for example, stones, obstructions, immunosuppressions, they are treated as complicated UTIs. Then the investigations. So there will be increased WBCs in the urine sample. Greater than five WBC cells are seen if seen in one high power field right that means under the microscope in at one place if you see more than <coughs> five wbc's then it is increased wbc's which is called as pyuria pyuria means increased pus in the urine so pyuria or leukocytouria urine nitrites urine nitrites are certain uh, certain substances in the urine which are present only when there is bacterial invasion of a urinary tract right because these bacteria they convert nitrates into nitrites so urine nitrates are only found if the uh, urinary tract is infected with certain bacteria especially gram negative bacteria so this urine nitrate test becomes positive urine culture of midstream urine it becomes positive and it shows sensitivity also urine acid fast bacilli if the urinary tract is infected with the uh, mycobacterium so next category of disease is urinary tract obstructions. We will not go into this because this is the syllabus for fourth year. So urinary tract infection, for example, most common stones or there are strictures. You can see the ureters have become, um, they have become with no space, right? There is no space in the ureters. So ureteropelvic strictures, stenosis again, the, the ureter have become stenos. There are certain fibrous bands or polycystic kidney because of the polycystic kidney there is urinary tract obstructions right here also you can see urethral stenosis right the urethra is becoming stenosed urethral sphincter uh, has developed some spasms 
so the urethral sphincter is not allowing the urine to pass so these are urinary tract obstructions prostrate you can see prostrate in the outside this urethra in the males only so if prostrate has become enlarged then it suppresses the it compresses the urethra leading to urinary tract obstructions so what are the causes within the lumen means within the within the uh, within the ureter or within the urethra for example stones stones within the ureter or within the urethra they can lead to urinary tract obstructions inflammations clots blood clots blood um, the renal tumors within the wall of urinary tract for example urethral stricture the wall of the urethra is having some trouble pelvic ureteric neuromuscular dysfunction congenital bladder neck obstructions right the bladder neck is congenitally obstructed neuropathic bladder or pressure from outside for example from prostrate for example benign prostate hypertrophy pregnancy tumors or phimosis condition in a uh, condition called as phimosis which leads to obstruction of the urinary tract next is renal cyst so sometimes the kidney develops renal cyst and the most important disorder in this is polycystic kidney disease which is an autosomal dominant disorder which is a genetic disorder and because of the genetic disorder the person develops a uh, polycyst in the kidney and in later stages this polycystic kidney di- kidney disease leads to acute kidney injuries which ultimately leads to end stage renal disease which is renal failure the cortex medulla is filled with large number of cysts and then slowly compresses the surrounding normal tissues and patient develops progressive renal failure and large kidneys clinical features the kidneys becomes large they are palpable there is abdominal discomfort there is hematuria there is uh, more utis stones progressive renal failures and all next is renal vascular disease also we will also not study this in detail for example renal artery stenosis right the artery becomes stenose the artery becomes less uh, in aperture less in size which leads to the reduced blood flow leading to damage right some of the vascular disease are renal artery stenosis acute renal infarction you can see it here if the renal arteries they are uh, blocked with due to block due to atherosclerosis you can see here or block due to some embolism thromboembolism then it leads to renal infarction just like myocardial infarction which leads to kidney damage and ultimately leads to kidney failure other conditions like hemolytic uremic syndrome thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura ttp systemic sclerosis they also leads to the renal vascular problems then renal tumors renal tumors we can well imagine the tumors of the renal the, the kidneys the benign tumors and the malignant tumors as well they causes kidney failures so the topic starts with kidney failure we will study about this kidney failure in the next video right